and uh, I'm a campus engagement specialist with the Ryerson Career and Co-op Center. We are so thrilled to have you here today for a conversation about connecting with early talent. To give you some background, Investing in Inclusion is a program that we've been hosting for the past few years. The intention of this program is to help our employer partners better understand how to support individuals from equity seeking groups in the workplace. The intention uh, of us doing that is simply because we want our students to be able to enter into spaces that they can thrive in and feel comfortable um, navigating their careers in essentially. So we're so happy that you're engaged in the conversation and that you want to hear from us today. Um, I'm going to introduce the team that's going to be joining us today. So on the call we have with us Emily Jones, who's the Senior Manager of Program and Curriculum Development. Um, Emily, I'm just going to ask you to switch slides, please. And we also have Mark Witten, our Campus Engagement Specialist for Engineering and for Science. We have Maurice Fernandez, who's a Career Education Specialist for Science. And we have Veronica Lee, who's our Campus Engagement Coordinator. Veronica is going to be on the back end supporting with the technical, um, the technical stuff, as well as uh, if you have any questions, Veronica is your person. So when we ask for questions, Veronica will also be filtering through, through those questions to feed back to us for the discussion. Um, so please feel free to connect with her uh, in the chat. And with that, I'm going to throw it over to my colleague, Mark. Thank you, JP. So we recognize that we might have people joining us from multiple places in Canada. Um, as you can see, I have virtually placed myself on Ryerson's campus and Ryerson's campus does sit on Aboriginal land. So we'd like to take a moment to recognize the land that we're on today. Um, so Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee's who bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and people, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And with that same spirit in mind, I'd like to turn things over to Emily to kick us off with some housekeeping as well as a high-level agenda for the day. Emily. Thanks, Mark. So a few considerations for uh, today's session. The first is to please keep your mute to keep, please keep your mics muted uh, to ensure that we're minimizing background noise. Um, also, please use the speaker view option. So you should see that option in the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, switching over to speaker view will make sure that you can see the video of the person who is speaking at all times. Please use the chat box to ask any questions as Jean-Pierre mentioned. Uh, Veronica will be fielding those questions through to the speakers so we uh, can make sure that we address your questions. We will also be leaving time at the end um, for any questions that you might have. So we'll make sure that we can uh, get to some of those questions. Closed captioning is available and has been turned on. So if you need closed captioning, that is an option that's available to you. And then finally, by participating in this, we are all agreeing to be part of a social contract of respect. Um, so that means that when we are engaging in conversations, we ask that you do so respectfully. And if you disagree, we encourage disagreement and we encourage debate, uh, but we ask that you do so respectfully um, and res in, in respect of others that are on this call. With that said, I will hand it over to Maurice. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, like uh, JP mentioned, I am a career education specialist supporting the Faculty of Science undergraduate student population. And prior to joining Ryerson, I spent over 20 years in HR recruitment. My last portfolio was actually in early talent acquisition and employment brand. And once again, thank you so much for your time today. In today's uh, webinar, we will be covering how to build uh, your brand on campus, connecting with students from equity seeking groups, how do, you, uh, how do students engage with opportunities? And then we'll turn it over to Emily who will be moderating a student panel with three uh, Ryerson students. But before we begin, we'd like to launch into a poll just to get a little bit of background information on who we have today. So do you currently have a dedicated campus team? And we'll just let Veronica. Veronica, I can't actually see. Yeah, no worries. We're just at 66% uh, of participants have participated. I'll give everyone maybe five more seconds. If they want a, sure. a response and otherwise I'll close the poll. Great. Hi there. 
Oh, wow. Okay. So we've got, uh, it's almost, so 57% of us on this call do have a dedicated campus uh, team. The other 43% don't, and that's, that's excellent. So I actually, in my previous employer, uh, we didn't have a dedicated campus team. I was the team of one, and uh, I was managing campus recruitment all across Ontario, Quebec, and uh, Western Canada, and also into a uh, bit of the U.S. So it can be done with a team of one. It's a lot of influencing without authority. Uh, take my word for it. So Emily, if we can go to the next slide, please. So when it comes to uh, today, the world of work, rapidly evolving technologies and societal trends have really affected career paths, not just for experienced workers, but students as well. I'm not sure, but uh, does anyone on this call or today's webinar have any children in the primary school system? Then you might be interested in learning that a recent World Economic Forum report entitled The Future of Work estimated that 65% of children entering the primary school system today will ultimately end up in work, working in jobs that do not exist yet. Um, in 2018, the Career and Co-op Center uh, began developing a career development model that would assist in designing responsive programs and help students, uh, help students' confidence in career and professional development. The career cycle is a reflection of the importance of lifelong learning uh, towards effective workforce adaptation and navigation. And this decision really aligns well with our mission statement of building careers for life. It's important to note that a lot of employers sometimes feel that the students are in the target phase of the career cycle. But the reality is the majority of our students are in the learn stage of the cycle and are really trying to explore what to do with their degrees after graduation. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Emily. Awesome. So from our most recent student survey on how students are accessing co-op and career information, we learned that 30% of our students access career info via the career and co-op newsletter. It's important to note that at Ryerson, we operate under a faculty labor model. And what that means is that each of our faculties has a dedicated career education and co-op team assigned to it. So for instance, myself and Mark are uh, assigned and dedicated to the faculty of science. My colleague JP is uh, affiliated with the faculty of community services. So if you're targeting a particular program or faculty, let us know and we can put you in touch with the right people so that your, your programs, your jobs, and your opportunities get, uh, get to the right student populations. We also know that 22% of our students look, are still looking forward to learning about you at career fairs. Um, they will look a bit different this fall and Mark will explain how, plus other avenues to help you engage with our student population. And then 20% of our students are also looking towards Magnet. For those not familiar with Magnet, it is our job uh, platform. It is our job posting platform. And it's free for employers to post their job openings, either for internships, co-op placements, summer opportunities, or if you're looking for alumni. The Career and Co-op Center supports alumni up to five years after their, their final academic year. So Emily, if we can go to the next slide, please. So what are our students looking for? Not surprisingly, they are looking for ways to gain experience. Internships at co-ops are one way of doing that, but they're not the only way. Think about other experiential learning opportunities your organizations can host. Something like a job shadow or case competitions or even sponsoring a hackathon are great ways for students to get to know about your place of work and some of the challenges that your company or your industry is facing. Students also want to meet employers and learn about the ways that they can make uh, their applications stand out in the recruitment process. And also, more importantly, what makes you a great place to work? While it may be tempting to bring senior leaders to campus events or webinars, my experience has been that students are interested in learning from directly from peers or recent grads into your organization. So we recommend making space for these individuals to support your campus recruitment initiatives. It's an extra bonus of their Ryerson grads as well. So keep that in mind. Also remember the majority of our students are in the learn part of the career cycle. So discuss the career option, uh, career path options in your job descriptions. In, if your early talent is, is successful in the job that they're hired for, talk to them about where this can take them within your organization. We recommend highlighting transferable skills in your job postings, as well as what are you willing to train on? And finally, does your organization have a mentorship program at your company? If so, make sure you highlight this program to students because they're valuing mentorship opportunities above other benefits uh, as they begin their career journey. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to JP. Thanks so much, Maurice. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think 
everything that Maurice talks about is really, really important. And now we just want to take a bit more of a focus on looking at students from equity seeking groups and just highlighting some things you should know. Um, one of the most important things that we want to know is that students from equity seeking groups belong in all programs, faculties, areas of work. And so, you know, it's important to, to consider that no matter what industry you're in, there's an opportunity to hire individuals from equity seeking groups. So just want to keep that at, at top of mind. Um, as we get into this conversation, we want to talk about a few, you know, key concept, concepts of reference, um, primarily being equity, diverse, equity, diversity, justice, and intersectionality. So equity is sort of the baseline that we want to achieve, right? This is the opportunity for us to acknowledge that not everyone has the same starting place and therefore we need to adapt the way we are approaching the work that we do, the way we recruit people, the way we support people to, in, to acknowledge that there, everyone comes at a different starting place. And so it's important for us to be able to adapt the things that we're doing to recruit and attract students so that everyone has the same access to the opportunities we're trying to uh, trying to present to students. The second thing is diversity. So diversity is a word that we hear a lot getting thrown around and, and through our conversations with employers we often hear diversity being referenced in the sphere of racial identity and that's really important but it's one piece of identity. So we want to bring into this conversation you know the other pieces of identity which might include ability, which include race, which include gender, which include um, things like religion. So there's lots of facets of an individual's identity that will feed into um, this conversation. And we also wanna bring into the conversation um, a piece around uh, other parts of identity. So looking at education diversity um, and looking at things like that that may help us understand a student's experience more deeply and realize that it's not just one facet of their identity, of their identity that's, that's important. Um, we wanna talk about justice. So justice is sort of the utopian world that we want to get to. This is the space where we've taken a, a strong look at our, our services, at our practices, and we've been able to reconstruct them to ensure that there are no barriers for anyone to reach and uh, for anyone to access our services and supports through. And I think that's a really important uh, place to strive to. And so that requires constant analysis of the work that we're doing and how we do that work. The final term I want to reference is intersectionality. This is really, really important. And so I, met, I touched on this a little bit when talking about diversity. It's really important for us to offer programming that does support individuals within their uni unique identities, but also acknowledge that other parts of their identities might impact how they view the world, how they engage the world, and the barriers that might be holding them back. And so that's really, really important for us to, to highlight and note um, when having this conversation. We want to now jump into a little bit of what, what we're hearing from students about what they care about, what's important to them. I should note that this is very much scratching the surface. So we're going to be breezing over this conversation, but there are lots of opportunities for us to have this conversation beyond today. And I would encourage you to get in touch with us to do that. So firstly, we're hearing from students that they want to make an impact. You know, they want to know that their work has value. What does that mean? They want to know that the work that they're doing is able to help them or they're able to see how their work impacts the, the, organizational, the organization's purpose and has real outcomes for the organization. They want to feel like there's personal growth. So, you know, are there opportunities for them to have continued learning or take on leadership opportunities, whether formal or informal? These are all really important pieces. They don't want to feel like they're, they're stagnant. And I think that's probably true for, for all individuals, I imagine. Really, that's imp what's important for students around looking at an organization is their organizational commitment to things like diversity. So it's nice to have a diversity statement on your, on your website, but what does that mean in practice, right? So do you have an actual policy that you can talk to or that you're highlighting that talks about how you're impacting diversity and inclusion within your organization? Do you carry stats on what representation looks like at your organization that you can present uh, to individuals who are interested at the organization? These are all really important conversations to have. Um, just a little antidote around that. We often are working with employers and sometimes the idea of with a conversation around supporting Indigenous students come up. And a question that we'll ask is, you know, does your organization um, connect or talk about um, things that are maybe 
not necessarily uh, well accepted in the indigenous community. So for example, does your, does your organization support the pipeline? If it does, then what's the conversation around that and how do you reconcile that with, with wanting to support indigenous students uh, or indigenous employees? That's an important conversation to be able to engage in. They want to know about education. So are there, can, are there regular learning opportunities for your staff and leadership around diversity and inclusion so that everyone's constantly growing in their awareness of how to create more inclusive spaces? And then finally, social responsibility. So what is your organization doing to support the communities it's working within? So are you engaging in the community? What is it doing in terms of the environment? Those are all things that are really, really important to students. So you need to be able to point to where they can learn more about that and be able to talk to it when engaging with our students. The next thing I want to talk about is looking at representation. Representation is really, really important. So firstly, representation at all levels of the organization. So are there black, indigenous, trans, and women um, leaders at your organization? If there's not, then you should be questioning why that is and how that's gonna change. Uh, is there representation in your marketing and promotion? So thinking about your print materials, commercial, commercial, um, commercials that you might have out in the world, or your presentation slides when coming on campus. Are there images on there that reflect the student population that you're trying to recruit? If you don't, something to consider. We want to think about uh, representation on your campus recruitment team. Are you coming to campus with a team that looks all the same? And so you want to make sure that the organization uh, reflects the student population that you're coming to engage with. And as Maurice mentioned, we would highly recommend that if you have alumni from, from Ryerson or the schools that you're going to, that you bring those people with you because they want to be able to hear what that journey looked like when that individual graduated from Ryerson University and went into the workforce. So we really encourage you to bring someone that can help tell that story. And then we want to talk about accessibility. This is really, really important. Um, accessibility shows up in a variety of ways, but you know, in its most practical form, how are you delivering information to our to to the to our students? Um, if you're going to be on campus, is it through a US like when you're coming on and you're showing a presentation? Do you have that presentation accessible on a USB stick for students who might have visual impairments? Um, is your presentation going to be accessible through a screen reader? Um, are you bringing interpreters and or considering closed captioning for, um, for the presentation that you are going to be showing to students? These are all things that are really, really important. Uh, we encourage you to consider the adult learning theory, which looks at um, how you might engage with different learners. And we want you to consider that for when you're engaging with students. We want to consider as well web and online accessibility. This is really, really important also. Obviously, we're in a digital world, especially now. You know, do you have alt text on your, on all of your images? Are the colors well contrasted? So for anyone who has visual impairments, they're able to access the, the information that's on there. Um, is your website compatible with screen readers? Are you using inclusive language? That's a really big, a really big piece. So if your website talks, uh, refers to individuals in, um, you know, pronouns such as he or she, it's important to acknowledge that some people don't fall within the, those um, gender norms. And so how are we excluding people by, you know, sticking to things like gender norms? And so those are all like nuanced things that we should really be considering when talking about accessibility and the way we want to engage with various populations. The final thing is we want to talk a bit more about how we support students from equity seeking groups. So at Ryerson, Equity, diversity, and inclusion is really, really important to us. It's a part of our core tenants. And so we definitely have um, various ways that we support students. One is through targeted communication. Something that we've done more recently is sent out a self-ID survey to students across campus and had them self-identify whether they would like to receive programming that is identity specific. So what that means for us and for you is that in the event that you want to host an event for say racialized students or students with disabilities, we now have a targeted group of students that we can message um, to attend that event. We can break that down as far as year of study and program of study as well. So it's really exciting to say that we have that information and we can definitely support students in that way and communicate with them in that way. We also do targeted programming. 
it's really important for us to be able to say that students or acknowledge that students come from different identities and might need support as a result of that. So we work with student groups that support individuals from different, different equity groups. We also support students through things like an EDI breakfast before career fairs. Um, that's where we bring students in from equity seeking groups to sit down with employers because we know traditional career fairs might sometimes pose uh, a barrier for certain individuals. Um, we have tailored programming um, in, in the example of something called Career Builder, which is a three month program that is a tailored program specifically for individuals from equity seeking groups to help develop their career readiness skills. So those are all things that we're doing for students and there's much, much more, but those are just a sampling of some of the things that we are doing. Last, 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 we want to talk about how we can support you. Um, so as we mentioned, we offer tailored programming. What we try to do is speak to you, talk to you about what are your needs and how can we develop programming that responds to that. So that's something that we're definitely ready to do with you. We have training that's ready to go to help support you within your organizations. So things like unconscious bias training, positive space training, how to create vibrant and diverse communities. Those are all trainings that we offer you as an employer and are willing to have those conversations with you um, when needed and when necessary. Finally, if you need support, if there's something that we can't support you in, we can definitely support you in connecting with the right people who can. So, you know, if it's working with community partners that, we, that we're familiar with, we're happy to make those connections for you. So please do reach out to us and let us know um, how we can help you along this journey. With that said, uh, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Mark, who's going to talk to you a bit more about some of the more uh, tailored programming that we have that you can engage with. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you, JP. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a campus engagement specialist and I support STEM-based employer initiatives. Uh, so, so far, we've heard from Maurice on how students are consuming information related to your brand. We've learned about the career cycle. And then from JP, we learned about what equity-seeking students are looking for, how we support them, and how we support you. Um, what I'd like to turn it over to now is just give you an understanding of some of the opportunities that are available uh, to engage these students in a virtual world. If this was a different time, we would have much more of an extensive list, but the things that I'm going to present to you today really have been optimized for a virtual world. Uh, so I'm going to kick things off with a real quick poll. Again, if Emily could go to the next slide. Just a quick true or false poll on whether or not you believe that the only time that you should be engaging with students is when you have positions available for them. So I'm gonna cue the awkward silence here for a moment as we get the results coming in. And Veronica, when you think that we have enough responses, if you wouldn't mind share that, it would be great. But just over 65% of people have responded. I'll give everyone maybe five more seconds and then I'll switch it back over to Mark. Excellent. I'd hum some music, but couldn't really carry a tune with a forklift, so I'll just I'll avoid that. All right. Oh, everybody is on the ball. See, I put that in as such a loaded question and I thought we were going to get some true responses, but you are 100% correct. Um, if we could just go to the next bill, the, the answer is false with a catch. So we will be talking about engagement opportunities for you. I'm so proud of you. You're doing such a good job so far. So the only time that we will kind of kick back on opportunities, we've had some employers that have reached out to us and said, Mark, you know, I want to do an information session that talks about our company culture and all the perks that we have and why it's such a great place to work. That gets us really excited. And my next question is typically, okay, that's fantastic. Do you have positions for students available in the next three to six months? If the answer to that is no, those are kind of things where it's like, okay, maybe we can find something alternative because we don't want students to get excited about your employment brand and all the great things that you're doing and why it's such a great place to work. When you don't have positions available, it leaves a bit of a sour taste in the student's mouth and you potentially lose them. Um, that being said, if we could go to the next slide, I'm now going to talk about some engagement opportunities that you all as employers have um, that are really great ways to give students a taste of what it is that you can teach them and what it is that they can learn in your organization. So the first one that we have is along the lines of thought leadership webinars. I personally have been exceptionally humbled at the number of people that have either proactively reached out to me or I've reached out to volunteering their time. I mean, we're all inside. We all have more time on our hands, but, you know, we've done things like non-traditional career paths in pharmaceutical industries. We've had PhD level panels where, 
you know, students have the ability to talk to these folks and understand, you know, what are the benefits of getting an MBA? Is it something that I should do? Um, these are things that we can absolutely support. Maybe your organization hires a ton of grad students and you say, you know what, like we could really do some thought leadership around what it's like to gain, to gain employment as a graduate student. So if you have ideas, if you have expertise, please feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to help you tailor something. The second thing that I'll talk about, Maurice and his team work really hard with students internally around things um, on workshops around resume clinics, LinkedIn tutorials, mock interview sessions. Um, what students really do appreciate though as well is hearing from industry. You are the folks that they're potentially going to be working for and working with. So it's kind of the icing on the cake for the, the stuff that we do internally. Um, if again, you have ideas that you are exceptionally skilled, um, one of our software vendors actually did something where they talked about the transition from student life into work life, and it was really, really well received. So again, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions or if you have ideas. The next thing that we offer is something that honestly, I think it's a little bit overlooked and Maurice mentioned it at the start, our case competitions. Case competitions can be as short as you know, a half day session, it could be as long as a couple of months. It really depends on the opportunity that you want to put forth to the students. So where the students really benefit is they get the ability to work on real life issues that you are faced with. Um, and I can tell you that the benefit that you will get from the students is that they have very interesting viewpoints. They bring, bring fresh perspectives, they bring fresh ideas, and they're not afraid to challenge the norm. So if you have something that you've been struggling with, if you're looking for new ideas and new ways to do it, reach out to us. We're happy to help you out. Um, one thing I will mention is that the term competition typically means that there's a prize. Um, as you know, students love money. So if you are financially able to give some sort of a monetary gift, they will absolutely appreciate that. But it doesn't have to be something tangible. It could be, you know what, the winning group or the winning student from this competition gets to have uh, a lunch and learn session with a high level executive. Um, or it could be something like, you know, the next time we have an internship or a co-op, this group goes up to the top of the list because they've already demonstrated their, their credibility, their capabilities. So again, we can get super creative with this kind of stuff. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is our zones. So this is something that is very specific to Ryerson. We are very big on zone learning. We have 10 interdisciplinary zones that are on campus today. And a zone is think of it like an incubator for an entrepreneurial student that has an idea, but they need access to physical space. They need access to people that are gonna help them with vetting ideas or bringing out their businesses. These folks are always looking for industry representation. Um, there are some zones out there, the science discovery zone comes to mind where um, they have this course that's called Sci Triple Eight. And essentially what it is is from time to time, they want industry representation to come in and manage a case study, deliver a lecture. So there are many, many different opportunities that are out there. Again, these are ones that have really been optimized for a virtual world. But if you have other ideas or if you've done something with other universities that you think would work really well, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So I, I also recognize that not everybody on the phone here today is going to have opportunities for students, whether they're short term or long term. That's OK. We all know, at least I believe and I hope that eventually this is all going to go away and we, you know, those positions are going to come up again. That said, there are folks that are on the call today that do have these opportunities available. So I want to talk about how we can help. The first is with more shorter term engagements, which are in the form of internships and co-ops. I want to take a moment here to talk about the nuances and difference between the two because a lot of folks that I deal with, they kind of use those two terms interchangeably, but there are some nuances and some differences. Think of an internship as a short term contract that's agreed upon between yourself as the employer and the student. The university does a lot of work on the front end. So you send us your positions, we post them, we try to get as many balls on that job as possible. Once that student is hired with very few exceptions, the university traditionally doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of interface with, with you or the student after the fact. So it's an agreement between two people. A co-op, on the other hand, is also a short-term contract, but it's a contract between the university, the student, and the employer. So throughout the term, there are multiple checkpoints with a co-op specialist, with the student, as well as the hiring manager to make sure that the work that they are doing is relevant to 
what they are studying in their academic props, because that's one thing with a co-op, it does have to be related to what you're studying. So as an example, you're probably not going to put a chemistry student as your primary recruiter. And now that I think about it, I know that Maurice being a former recruiter could probably make some sort of a joke saying that you have to have chemistry as an individual, as a recruiter to reach out to other people. You see what I did there? I can't see you all but I'm, I'm assuming that you're all laughing hysterically because it was exceptionally clever. Um, that being said, you know what I'm talking about. The days of having a co-op where you're shoved into a dusty corner, you're not spoken to, and every so often you go out to get coffee are all long gone. Um, so it does have to be relevant to the academic area that that student is in. The other benefit to you as an employer is that you can get up to $3,000 as a tax credit from the Canadian government for every co-op student that you hire. The next section is more along the lines of full-time recruitment for students that are about to graduate, have graduated, or their alumni. Like Maurice mentioned, we support our alumni for up to five years after graduation. As Maurice mentioned as well, we do have this internal job board that's called Magnet. It is free of charge for you to use. You have the ability to post jobs yourself by creating a profile, or you can reach out to us at hire at ryerson.ca, and we will post those jobs on your behalf. What we would ask of you though, when you go and you post a job yourselves, let us know because we have channels that we can use to help optimize and amplify those positions. We have weekly newsletters that go out to students. We have a D2L course shell. Some of us also actually have a WhatsApp chat group where we can extend those offers out. Tell us what you're looking for with respect to a student. Tell us, you know, your ideal kind of student candidate. We will help you out with that. Now, being a former salesperson, I would also be very remiss if I did not put in a shameless plug for our virtual STEM career fair that is happening on September 24th of this year. Um, some of you on this call may have already received the save the date quest, the uh, save the date email that we sent out. Um, if you haven't received it, feel free to reach out to us, connect with us. We are happy to have you there. Uh, we're still working out the finer details along pricing, processes, procedures, and things like that. But this is a fantastic way to connect with any one of these particular groups if you are hiring those students. Um, so to finish off my section, I kind of sat back and I thought about, you know, what are some of the most successful organizations doing that I am working with when it comes to attracting, hiring, and retaining top early talent? The first thing, and I cannot stress this enough, is they are consistently touching base with our students at multiple times throughout the year and building brand awareness by engaging students with some of the opportunities that we talked of. Campus recruitment is not a checkbox parody. It is not a one and done kind of a thing where you post a job and you're just like, okay, I'm gonna wait for the floodgates to open and all these students are gonna come in. It's not hosting one information session, you know, one out of three years and then wondering why you're not getting all the rock stars coming to your organization. It is a continuous thing, it is organic. And the more that you speak with these students at the start of their academic career, the more they're gonna recognize you when they're graduating and when it comes time for them to find employment. The other thing is pure time management. So I am very blessed and lucky to have a lot of very great partners that proactively reach out to me. I know that JP can say the same thing. When you proactively reach out to us with an idea, it could be, hey, you know, like we are hiring a bunch of students and there's a lot of concerns that are very common. We'd like to address this. Or, you know, hey, we're having this internal fair. I would love it if you could promote this to your students. Honestly, that goes to the top of my list because quite frankly, I'm a fan of working smarter, not harder. And that just helps us all out when you come to us and you approach us with ideas. The last thing is something that Maurice touched on as well as JP, um, identifying subject matter experts in your organizations that can speak to students. Maurice and I, as well as JP, are very, very connected with a lot of student organizations that are on campus. Some of those are equity seeking groups. Some of these are groups that are, delay, are, are related to the area of study that they have. Um, they're consistently looking for panelists, for speakers, for folks to do TED Talk style presentations. If you as an HR resource or any resource in your company know certain individuals that are exceptionally good and that will be able to do some knowledge transfer for students, bonus points if you're identifying an alumni as well, uh, because obviously from an alumni perspective, they walk the same halls, they've probably taken the same courses, they've had the same professors. It just creates that commonality and that instant connection because of the fact that they've done these same things. Uh, so that is it for my section of the presentation. If we go to the next slide, 
I wanted to quickly summarize the very key takeaways that we've all talked about today. If you don't remember anything else about this, I mean, I'll be upset, but these are the three kind of things that we wanted to really, to really kind of stress. So the number one thing for Maurice's section, if we could just go to the first builder, Emily, we don't want to assume that students know exactly what it is that they want to do after they graduate or during their studies they're mostly going to be in the learning stage. So sometimes it takes a little bit of finesse. Sometimes it takes some conversation and speaking with them and helping them understand where they can fit within your organization. The second thing from JP's section is that representation and accessibility matters. It's really key to identify, you know, where are the holes that we have in our diversity strategy and what are the strategies that we can implement in order to fix those holes. The last thing I know that I just spoke and I know that I just said this, so I'm not gonna harp on this too much, recruitment on campus is dynamic it's continuous it's organic and it's a never a one and done kind of a thing but we as a team are here to help you out we're here to help bounce ideas off each other and our goal is really to make sure that our students get hired at great opportunities and you get great early talent from us so i'm gonna pause here real quick i see that we're a little bit under and from a timing perspective so we may be able to take a couple of questions that have been coming through um veronica i'm gonna turn it over to you i know you've been monitoring the chat box there i just wanted to see if there's any questions that have come up that you'd like to put forward maybe two or three questions before we get into the student panel mark i think we've been doing a really great job because we don't have any employer questions at the moment um however Maybe I'll give everyone a few more seconds. If they want to send over a chat, I'm happy to read out your questions to the team. And I will have to apologize for the start of my call. I spoke out of turn. I did not realize that there was no public chat. Um, you can direct any questions that you have to Veronica if you do have them. Uh, we're very open. You know, if you have anything that maybe we haven't touched upon or you'd like more clarity on, we'll give it a nut. Maybe just a couple of seconds to see if anyone does have any questions. And while again, I can't hum, Maurice, did you like my joke about the chemistry between a recruiter and uh, having to speak to people? No comment. I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> All right. So we do have some questions coming through. Uh, what are you doing to help students prepare for their interaction with employers? I think Maurice would probably be the best one to answer that particular question. Maurice, you want to feel that? Can we see there? Maurice, do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. I did not hear it. Sure. So what are you doing to help students prepare for their interaction with employers? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So like Mark mentioned, uh, the career education team does run uh, several workshops. They are of the tactical variety, like uh, preparing your cover letter, resume, uh, interview preparation, um, how to create a, a outstanding or standout LinkedIn profile. And we're also uh, creating workshops or have created and delivered workshops on 21st century job skills like emotional intelligence. Uh, it looks like Maurice might have cut out, but I will add in addition to the workshops that the Career and Co-op Center provides, we do also partner quite a bit with our employer partners to assist with career development skills. So things like networking uh, is a big part of what we do. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have programs like the Career Builder Program that is a three month program for students to help develop, develop um, employability skills. So um, there are quite a few options for students to engage in when it comes to employability, develop, employability skill developments that we offer students. Great. Um, so we have two more questions coming through. Um, give me one second. Maybe I'll direct this one to Emily. Emily, could you explain the meaning of the target phase and the learning phase in the key takeaways? Yeah, absolutely. So this relates back to um, our career cycle framework, which I'll get it back up on the screen for uh, everyone's reference. We spoke to it uh, very early on in the presentation, so some folks might have missed it. But the career cycle framework is um, our model of career development. It's how we understand students' 
uh, and recent graduates uh, move through different phases of their career. Um, so the target phase is really about preparing and um, preparing to find and applying for work, whereas the learn phase is about reflecting on your personal strengths, researching possible um, career possibilities. And so uh, really the point to emphasize there is that whilst we recognize a lot of employers may come to campus assuming that students are uh, in the target phase ready to apply to jobs at your organization, what our research has shown is that most of our students even going into their final year are still learning about career possibilities um, and career pathways in their degree um, in their field of choice. And so it's important to tailor your engagement with students when you're coming to campus, you're engaging with them uh, according to that. So not assuming that they're ready to apply or they know exactly what they want to do, but rather that they may still be exploring possibilities. Thanks, Emily. Um, I have a question for Jean-Pierre and Mark. Any advice for employers focusing on part-time employment where they're targeting more first-year students as opposed to new grads? So I can hop in on this, um, and JP, feel free to add some flavor. Um, when it comes to part-time students, I mean, that's really, it could just be, you know, you're looking for a student to hop on and do some work for you, and the student is looking maybe just to earn some, some money on the back end to pay some bills and stuff like that. Um, that's a scenario where Magnet would be very helpful in conjunction and working with myself or JP or any of the other campus engagement specialists. Um, super easy for you to reach out to us. You tell us kind of what it is that you're looking for. In normal years, we would have something called a part-time career fair. Um, but given that there is a lot of retail hospitality focus and those organizations are currently open today, um, I'm not 100% sure if that will be happening. The quickest thing that I could say is if you are just looking to fill a part-time position for a first or second year student, reach out to us, post a position on Magnet, let us know. We'll help amplify that for you and get as many folks on there as possible. And JP, I don't know if you'd have anything else that you want to add on that. Uh, the only thing I'll add is echoing exactly what Mark said, but just the other piece is students are looking for part-time jobs. So, you know, do, don't discredit that as, as what we're, you know, we're definitely looking to work with you um, to help share those opportunities because a lot of our students do work part-time while engaging with full-time school. So we're happy to support you in that. Awesome. Um, and Veronica, I think just in the interest of time, do you have any other questions that have come through or? We do have a few, but if you like, I can compile them and maybe we can save them for the end. Um, that way we can kick off the student panel. Absolutely, yeah, because I know folks are, are super interested in hearing from the students. So thank you very much for all the questions. We really appreciate it. We hope this was helpful. Uh, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn things over to Emily to lead and moderate the student panel uh, and introduce the folks we have on the line here. So take it away, Emily. Thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, what students want and, and what students are looking for in employment opportunities, but it would be great to hear from students themselves. So we've got three fantastic students with us today. We've got Ben, Deborah, and Bianca. I'll let each of them introduce themselves. So we'll start with Ben. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm, as you can see, pronouns he, him, financial mathematics at Ryerson. I'm headed into my final year, um, and I've been a part of the co-op program with, uh, with financial mathematics and the Career and Co-op Center uh, ever since my second year. It's been a wonderful experience so far, and I'm happy to see everyone today. Thanks, Ben. Deborah, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm Deborah, um, and I'm in my final year of the computer science program. I'm looking forward to finishing up um, as of October. Um, and yeah, I've also been part of the um, computer science co-op program as well um, since my second year. Um, and yeah, it's just been a great experience and I'm just thankful to be on the panel today. Thanks Deborah, and finally, Bianca. Hello everyone, hopefully everyone can also hear me all right. Um, yeah, I'm Bianca. Um, I'm in going into my second year of food and nutrition and food, and I am the communications and events coordinator for the School of Nutrition. And it's been an amazing um, uh, summer job, and I'm continuing it in, during this upcoming school year. And it's lovely to see you all or hear you all. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. I've turned off my screen sharing, but if you want to remain um, in speaker view so that you can see. Uh, our speakers whenever they are speaking and um, that will help you kind of see their face when when 
um, when they're speaking. So I've got a couple of questions for our student panel. Um, and really what we're going to be talking about today are topics around the experience of working virtually. So each of them are working this summer in various capacities. We'll also be touching on what they're looking for in a post-graduation employer um, and any uh, advice they might have for everyone on the call around onboarding virtually and, and supporting students who are working virtually as it seems like we'll be in this uh, remote working environment for a little while still. So I'll kick off with the first question. This will be for the three panelists. Uh, since March, the labor market in Canada has been has shifted dramatically. Most of us have uh, moved to working entirely remotely, adapting our work, working practices and our habits along the way. Each of you have been keeping busy in different ways this summer, focused on your professional development. So could you tell us a bit about the work that you're doing and your experience adapting to this remote world? And I'll start off with you, Deborah. I think you're muted, Deb. There yeah. we go. Uh Okay. Um, yeah, this summer. Um, so I'm doing like an internship, um, like as I, as I apply to full time roles. Um, and presently, I'm just a, a web developer uh, for this um, nonprofit organization called Rewriting the Code. And I'm part of their um, we Write Your Summer program. And I've just been working with like um, three other people to create a job portal for the organization. Um, and I partly, um, so I've partly used I'm partly, sorry, I'm used to working remotely, um, especially because like of my other work, the other work terms that I've done. Um, and like, I've just had the opportunity to work from home. So I would say um, at this point, I'm pretty used to it. Um, but I think what has really helped with adapting is um, doing things like daily stand up. Um, because like being in tech, we do working agile um, i've worked agile quite a few times and doing daily stand-ups just really helps me um, communicate with my team because i find that communication really helps um, and throughout the day um, and also i find that it can also be tough staying motivated um, especially uh, being inside these days um, but i think creating a schedule has kind of helped me kind of stay um, accountable using stuff like I usually use Asana, which is really helpful, um, which is kind of like planning out my day and just, um, yeah, staying focused. Great. Thanks, Deborah. Um, what, one of the things I love most about working with students is that they are so casual about some of the amazing things that they're doing. Like, oh, I'm just casually building a job portal for this entire organization. <laughs> um, thanks, Deborah. I'll go over to Bianca next. So can you tell us about what you're doing this summer um, and how you've adapted to working remotely? Yeah, for sure. So um, again, I'm the communications and events coordinator. So um, my main role is to increase student engagement within the nutrition and food department, along with my supervisor. So my main tasks are mostly to help coordinate events targeted for nutrition and food st um, students. Um, we collaborate and connect with other Ryerson departments and student groups to develop and improve upcoming program, especially for the next um, school year. And I also manage our Instagram page to increase student engagement online and monitor its effectiveness. And I also create um, visual content for our, like weekly um, emails and just for Instagram as well. So um, right now, yeah, I, I've started just working online. So I'm pretty much used to it. I think the only um, two issues I've had in adapting to it is like communicating across in virtual meetings because I'm usually um, used to just like in-person meetings. So just learning like virtual communication etiquette was something I had to learn. Um, I also had to learn more of the technical aspects like how do you share your screen or like how do you like make people co-hosts when you're like hosting an event online. Like that stuff was like new to me. Um, Zoom like was really frustrating at first but now I'm pretty much used to it. Um, I also um, had a hard time taking breaks. So I'm also taking three um, summer courses as well as uh, balancing this job. So I'm always on my computer. So I always like feel like I have something to do and I'll like do stuff at like 12 a.m. and then I'm like, wait, I should be taking a break. So um, my supervisor was able to give me advice on this and always remind me to take breaks. And I think it's also important for like everyone to remember to take breaks as well. Thanks, Bianca. I think Zoom was a challenge for all of us as we transitioned. Um, and, and the last thing that you mentioned, I think it's, uh, it highlights for me the importance of uh, in working remotely, particularly with, with students or, or recent graduates, how we need to sometimes make explicit some things that we take for granted if we've been working for a while. So um, things like how to communicate in a meeting, uh, we need to kind of explicitly name or support students through that process to understand that um, as we're onboarding them. 
Um, over to you, Ben, what are you working on this summer and, and how have you adapted? Yeah, uh, better question is what am I not working on this summer? Um, so it's been very busy, of course, I think for all of us. Um, I've had the very fortunate opportunity to do my past 16 months uh, on co-op with TD Bank. Um, and I see some of you from TD on the line, hello. Um, so I've been working in data science and analytics, uh, supporting personal uh, banking products. Um, and I've supported a couple of different teams during my time. And I've also been pretty fortunate that the entire time I've been working for the bank, we've had the capabilities to work from home. Um, we usually did maybe one or two days a week work from home. So that kind of really helped me ease into it, having that flexibility right from the start. I think that's something that's really important to students um, when they're going into the workplace is, you know, having both options. Because uh, I felt that it was it was really nice for me to be able to adjust and see how the difference is in working from home versus working in the office. Kind of like Bianca, I'm keeping very busy with courses. So I'm taking two courses this summer as well. Um, and I think that kind of ties back to what kind of Maurice and, and JP were saying about we're still in that learn phase. Um, we're all taking courses, trying to figure out what we're doing. Um, and we're all trying to learn, you know, what balance is right for us, uh, what kind of skills we're trying to adapt, and how much we can take on our plate. Um, a couple really interesting things that I have taken away for uh, adapting to the work from home environment is one, the number of meetings that never actually had to be meetings, and they can actually be emails instead. That's that's a really big thing, and I think you know I take that for granted more than anything that. When I was back in the office, I used to book a bunch of meetings with people, sit down, do a bunch of things. And now I'm realizing, you know, I'm, I, I'm essentially the baby in the workplace. Everyone has their children at home, has spouses or responsibilities at home, and they don't always have the time for meetings. And, you know, sometimes I don't have the time for meetings. So it's really become important to condense information into a smaller format, make it accessible to anyone who's there because it might not be available uh, in, in a meeting format for some people. Um, and as well, getting very self-reliant on technical skills um, has been very important. I used to rely a lot on coworkers and colleagues uh, to help me if I'm struggling with certain tools that were new. Uh, but of course, with COVID happening, we've had to take on a lot of new projects, a lot of new tasks at the bank. So I've had to pick up a lot of new tools, a lot of new languages. Um, so getting very self-reliant on my skills, um, learning how to most effectively Google the answer to my question is uh, a great skill that I've picked up. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, hearing some trends around, you know, learning a lot about communication and effective communication in, in the three roles that you've held, whether that's through uh, tools that you're using, Deborah or Bianca, for you know, learning different platforms that you're using, or Ben, learning how many me meetings could have been emailed in, in the first place. Um, I'll skip on to um, a question more around how you're feeling about employment prospects. So the phrase unprecedented times has been used a lot lately, overused, some mates might say. Um, though it's been overused, we don't yet know what things will look like in six to 12 months in terms of employment prospects. What are some of the questions that you've been asking yourselves on about, about your future employment prospects? Um, and Ben, I'll start with you this time. Absolutely. Um, so questions that I've been asking myself are kind of related to a few things I've already touched on. One is, you know, will my future employer have flexible work options? I think that's something I'm putting uh, more and more important on my list. Um, I didn't think it was that important at first when I first started my career journey. Um, I just kind of said, you know what, whatever option they have, I'll take it. Uh, but now seeing how things can so quickly change and how adaptable I can be to work environments. Um, I think having those kinds of flexible work options would be very important for me going forward, um, especially because I don't know what kind of unprecedented times might happen in the future, right? Um, other questions that I've been asking for myself is, you know, what kind of support is my employer going to give me if another unprecedented time like this happens? Um, so we've seen a lot of really great support from my current employer. Um, and we've heard a lot of really great responses from other employers during this time as well, how they're supporting their employees, what kind of accommodations are they taking into account? Um, are the people managers listening to their employees when they're having struggles in this kind of work from home environment? Uh, those are some things that I'm taking really heavily into account. Um, and I guess as well, just oh, am I gonna be happy at work? That's kind of, I think the number one thing is, am I gonna be satisfied with the work I do every day? You know, I'm, I'm currently waking up at eight o'clock-ish every morning in my bed, in my house. Normally if I'm sleeping in, I'm sleeping to like noon or whatever. 
uh, am I going to be happy waking up and rolling out of bed to do my work in my house at eight o'clock in the morning? I think that's something I really want to value. Um, and that can take a bunch of different forms. So I'm not saying there's any one answer to that, but I think that's something that's very important for me moving forward. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, Bianca, what, what are some of the questions you're asking yourself about future employment prospects? A lot of questions. So um, one of them is because we are moving maybe to online or virtual um, work opportunities, if those jobs are mostly online, um, with the skills I have now, will those be able to transfer onto like those virtual jobs is one of my questions. Um, will there be enough student friendly jobs? Um, will they accommodate for um, us like having tests and stuff like will we be able to like let them know and be comfortable with letting them know that oh hey like next week I have a quiz is it okay if I have like a day off um, stuff like that um, is there job security or an opportunity to continue working with the organization or company um, is always something like no matter what um, job or job prospect I look into like that's one of my main questions um, also if these opportunities will help me move forward in my profession and if there's any um, opportunities for leadership are questions I ask myself and the employer. Thanks Yanka. Um, and Deborah, what about you? Um, yeah, um, adding on to what the panelists mentioned, um, yeah I have been asking myself a lot of questions about like um, not only now but like what the future is going to look like. Um, for example, like asking will I um, still be able to like work internationally um, because like in the future I'm I although like I, I love Toronto um, and like I love the work scene sorry this the tech space and everything um, I kind of also like exploring other places like other countries so with COVID and everything happening I'm like is that even going to be um, a possibility anytime soon um, and like also like as I apply for full-time roles apart from Canada should I be applying to other countries because um, I know every country is in its own like um, situation at the moment and even with visas and stuff like that it's like a lot of things come into factor so I'm kind of like is it worth um, is it worth trying out those roles or like trying for those roles um, and also like how much longer um, will remote work like be the primary way that we work um, like I think working remotely is I guess it is great because like um, we kind of have a bit more time to ourselves throughout the day. Um, and like, as long as we set a schedule, it's, it can, and we have like a good workspace, we can easily focus and get a lot done throughout the day. But like, at the same time, I do miss that person to person contact, um, like going out for lunches um, with my team, for example, um, or like just kind of like having those small talks, like with someone like next to you and at your desk. Um, so I do miss those aspects. So I'm, yeah, I do wonder like how much longer this is, is going to be our way of work. Yeah. So, so those are some of the things I've been asking myself. Absolutely. Thank you. It sounds like the three of you have some of this, the same questions that a lot of us are asking ourselves, you know, that with not knowing what is coming in six to 12 months, how much longer are we working this way? And um, one thing that I think, uh, Ben, you mentioned around, uh, stability. And I think Bianca and Deborah, we've talked about this before in our previous conversations is, you know, how, how, um, how much stability can be offered by future employers. We, we tend to have a misconception perhaps about this generation that's graduating into the workforce now that they want to move around from job to job. But what we're hearing from a lot of students is that they value stability uh, and opportunities for growth within organizations. So um, I think that's an important one to note and maybe something that becomes more important as we face less certainty. Uh, moving on to the next question, if you could wave a magic wand and have your ideal job after graduation, what would that look and feel like? What does a great first job after graduation look like to you? Uh, and what are you looking, like, looking for from a future employer? Bianca, I'll start with you. Sure. So um, I see myself in uh, the career field of dietetics and nutrition. Um, I want to be in a career where I'm continuously learning, um, has a positive and inclusive work culture, somewhere where I can uh, develop a large professional network and have mentorship as well. Um, in terms of from a future employer, I would want to feel valued in the workplace. Um, one example of that would be um, 
having someone that knows how to utilize people's strengths and understand their interests. So one example I would have is like if there was an opportunity to work on a project in a subject um, matter that I'm interested, they would let me know about it or refer me to it. Um, like I think that's something that a lot of students would really appreciate. Um, I also would want someone that likes to communicate a lot just so we have a lot of like clarifications because I'm a person that tends to have like a lot of questions along the way when we work on projects. So um, for an employer, I would someone would have to have an open line of communication. Great, thanks Bianca. And Deborah, what about you? Um, for me, so yeah, I think I see myself in the software development or like um, front-end web development space. Um, and yeah, just things around like um, creating like doing meaningful work um, that will actually make an impact on others. Um, and I think like when it comes to a great first job, I look at like um, just like a good um, onboarding experience, whether it's like remote or not, um, because I've had like some experiences in some work terms where um, my onboarding experience was not the best. Um, and I think that kind of like traumatized me a bit for the rest of the work term. Um, so I, I think now, and like I had another work term where it was a lot better. Um, and that really just like transformed the way I looked at the, at the company um, and just really affected the way I worked from that point on. So I look at things like that. Um, also, will it provide me with like great uh, growth opportunities? So like having things like mentorship, um, maybe having like a supervisor and a mentor um, and them constantly like challenging me. Um, like Bianca mentioned, mentioning like different opportunities that are available that will help me grow. Um, and I guess just like, yeah, looking out for me, providing feedback. Um, am I like being valued and like, can I grow in this organization? Um, that's another thing I look at. Um, and as for things that I look for in a future employer, I would say, yeah, opportunities for growth, um, as I mentioned, but also like things like um, good benefits um, and like, groups or like I think they also call them like guilds but basically like um, these small groups to where you get to meet people and like talk about topics aside from your work so maybe like machine learning or um, or book club or something like that um, just for you to just not a way for me to get to know other people um, in the company and kind of like learn a new skill um, and yeah and also does my personality like fit within the company culture um, I think being for me to like fit into a company culture is really what's gonna shape whether I enjoy working there um, and I actually like enjoy just being who I am there um, and I think if I fit well there then I um, am able to really like give my best and just be truly passionate about what it is that I'm creating or what it, like whoever I'm creating it for um, yeah so those are yeah some of the things that I look for Thanks, Deborah. Um, and you talked about onboarding. What are what are some of the things that that made the made a, a good onboarding experience? What are some of those elements that that are important for you? Um, I think like providing um, just like documentation as to how to get set up. So like maybe mentioning the different software that like my team is using um, and like how I can set that up, or like providing resources that I can go to. Um, to find those things um, maybe like even presentations like the one the work time that I had I remember they had like a whole like Google Drive just filled with resources um, and it was just like explaining um, like the different parts of the organization um, what they do um, and like how to get set up like in my role and and they also had um, these mini boot camps so like one was like getting to know the organization so we actually like sat down and we went through like presentation, a presentation about uh, what the organization is, their values, um, and then one more focused on tech and like what I'll actually be doing, what the product is about. So like, I think those really helped me. Like it was a lot of information to digest at once, but like at least I knew like it was all in one place that I can refer to and it just helped me um, transition quicker. Right, thanks for expanding on that. Um, and Ben, what about you? What does a great first job after graduation look like? Uh, um, so this is a really funny question to me because I, I, I have no idea, um, pretty much. So I, I mean, as they mentioned already, students mostly are kind of in that learning phase. Um, that would definitely include me. 
Um, financial mathematics program is one of those that you're you're kind of doing a little bit of everything. So you have some math, you got finance, you got accounting, economics, you kind of got a lot going on in there. And it gives you a lot of options to move around. And also, um, if you don't really have your mind set on anything specific quite yet, it could get a little confusing. So that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I don't really have an ideal position laid out. But what I can say in terms of what I want a job to feel like, um, and what I want an employer to be like, um, I can definitely kind of hammer that down a little bit more. I think I already mentioned in the previous uh, question that I answered is that I just want to be happy with what I do um, and that can take on a couple of different uh, faces it's mainly boiling down to is the work I'm doing does it feel valuable um, and or is it helping someone um, so I have to feel kind of like my work is achieving something really important uh, or you know helping out a group of folks uh, that are in need in some sort of way um, if I'm just kind of doing work without really be, being given a mission statement behind it or given a purpose behind it, um, it gets very, very numb for me, um, especially working in a very numbers heavy field, the numbers can kind of just dry up and it, it doesn't really feel like I'm doing anything fun or exciting or challenging at all. Um, so I really do want that from my employer. Um, Deb mentioned some great points uh, from a future employer about, you know, having a really good onboarding experience. Um, I think that is uh, number one, especially when you're looking at engaging students directly into their first place of employment, having an onboarding experience. That's your first impression pretty much. That's kind of like when a student walks in and gives their first handshake, your onboarding experience is that first handshake. Um, so you want to make sure that that's a lasting impression. Um, and I think a couple things that really make a difference for me is an employer that is openly communicating very frequently with their new recruits. Um, I know some employers might feel like they're getting really annoying if they're bombarding emails onto their new recruit, but trust me, they appreciate it um, because it genuinely makes them feel like they're part of the company now, uh, makes them feel like they're in the loop receiving all this information and that they're, they're actually being part of something. If you're sending like 17 emails a day, that's totally fine. Um, students really appreciate that because, you know, kind of makes it feel all the more real for them. Uh, so they really like that. Another thing that I look for in a future employer, and this really does reflect on me in the workplace, is you know, some of the, the philanthropic efforts that are, are going on with the employer. Um, are they supporting not only their employees, but their communities? Um, and how are they supporting their communities around them? Um, I really do take that into effect when I'm selecting employers that I'm applying to, and that's kind of base one. If there's an employer that has a job posting, it looks like a job that I'd really enjoy, but the employer is not doing a lot to support their communities um, or something like that, then I might not consider that employer as heavily as someone who is very actively engaging in their communities, providing assistance, uh, doing community work all over the place. So that's something I really do take into account and having access to leadership for these community efforts is something that's really important as well. I do like to engage in community efforts and I think having leadership opportunities in that regard would be really important for me. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, although you feel like you're still at the learn phase, I think you've done a lot of progress in identifying what you, what you like and, and don't like. So that's, that's a really good step. Um, I've got one final question for the panel and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so we talk about building careers for life at the Career and Co-op Center. In fact, it's, it's our mission statement is building careers for life. Yet we know that most graduates today will change careers up to three times over the course of their working life. Not just changing jobs, but changing careers entirely. So for the three panelists, what does building a career for life mean to you? And I'll start with you, Deborah. Um, for me, I would say it's, um, yeah, creating products um, that add value to others and like making a meaningful impact. So like, I think when it comes to companies, I kind of look at the products it is that they create um, and also try and like understand like who are they creating this for? Like, am I passionate about this product? Um, is this something that I see myself being excited to create or, or to um, contribute towards every day? Um, another thing is like constantly being challenged. Um, I feel like after, I feel like with, with coding, um, with development work, it's something like you're constantly um, doing something new or like you're learning something new about coding. But I think like, as I get more experience in the industry, coding it will eventually become repetitive 
Um, so I think it would be amazing like if a company can provide those resources for me to constantly be challenged um, or just even opportunities for me to kind of grow within the company or even like the ability to move teams. Like let's say if I really like software development um, and I work in that space for like maybe a year or two and then the opportunity for me to move into data science because like I recently developed an interest in that. Um, is there like an opportunity for me to do things like that? Um, that's another thing that um, I look at. Um, and yeah, having a mentor or a supervisor. Um, I remember one of my work terms, I, I had a buddy for like the first week and that was just to like help me kind of get used to um, the company um, and just how everything works. And then after that, I eventually made her my mentor. And like, we still talk now, even though like I'm not working there anymore. Um, and I think that she's really helped me grow in so many ways. And I think mentorship is something that um, a lot of people don't pay as much attention to. And I feel like it's something that we need to pay a lot more attention to, especially when we are like early in our careers. Um, so it'd be really nice for me to just have someone like within the organization um, to provide feedback, um, just like, I guess, challenge me in different ways um, and or like ch challenge me to try different different things. Um, yeah, so that I think, yeah, those are the three things that a career for life would, looks like. Thanks, Deborah. And I think, um, you know, mentorship is really critical in, in identifying potential um, other careers or pivots that you could make throughout your career. I know that I've relied heavily on my career mentors to help me make those decisions when I've, I've changed jobs or I've changed um, career path entirely. Ben, what about you? What does building a career for life mean? Oh boy, what a question. Um, so building a career for life, um, again, takes on a, a, a lot of different forms. And I think you mentioned that you summed it up kind of perfectly when you said that you, students are changing jobs very frequently or people are changing careers very frequently. Um, and there's a lot of reasoning behind that. And I think kind of what it boils down to most for me is just finding what feels right. Um, and it's very difficult to hammer down what feels right until you're, you're in it. Um, like personally, I'm never going to know just by reading a job posting what is the ideal job for me. It's never going to happen. It's going to be more about um, self-exploration through the means of doing impactful work. Um, and I think Deb brought up a lot of really great points as well, where she was saying, you know, I want to be doing varied things. I want to be doing things that create really great products for, for great people. And that's kind of similar to along the lines of myself, maybe not creating products in my scenario, but it would be, you know, doing great work for great people um, and doing a lot of varied tasks until I can find something that sticks. And I think that's why it's, it's, it's very important to encourage those career shifts in your employees as well. I know a lot of times um, employers will get a student for a job and then try to keep them in that position for as long as they possibly can. Um, but I think there should really be more of an emphasis on encouraging uh, employers to make students transition their jobs, either within the organization if they want to explore another job or explore a different career because it's about kind of mentorship and trying to help them figure out what's best for them. Um, and I think that'll only work to benefit your organization at the end of the day as well. If you're helping someone find a job that they truly love, then they're going to stick around, love, and put their 100% into it. Um, so I think that's really important for me is that just kind of rotating until I find something that sticks. Awesome. So, you know, what I'm hearing, connecting back to the theme of stability earlier, it might not be stability in that you want to be in the same job but you might want to stay in this, within the same employer and see really uh, that employer showing you support for uh, allowing you to, to explore different opportunities to find something that is really fulfilling. Thank you for that, Ben. Uh, and finally, Bianca, what does building a career for life mean to you? Well, um, a career for life would mean it would, the career would actually relate to what I've been learning in my degree and my placements because, or else I would just feel like I wasted like four years for nothing, right? I would want those skills and like all those knowledge or learning opportunities to be applied to where I'm working. Um, I would want the career to 
uh, yeah, again, build on the uh, skills that I've been learning throughout my years of school. Um, also allowing me to live a healthy lifestyle. I would want like a career that doesn't make me feel like I'm getting burnt out like at the end of every week. I would want something like Deb said that would have challenges, but like kind of like positive challenges where you enhance your skills in problem solving and gain more knowledge. And um, also like you can still focus on your um, mental well-being. And what uh, Ben was saying, like, I would want a job that, uh, that aligns with my goals and makes me feel happy and where you have like a lot of guidance and support in your field and offers roles where you can practice your leadership. Great, thank you. Thanks so much to all three of you. Um, I'm just quickly checking uh, the chat from Veronica. I do have one question already, but uh, if anyone else has questions, please um, send them through to Veronica. So the first question for the three panelists, have any of you attended a virtual interview? Um, how was the experience and what could be done to improve the experience of interviewing virtually? Okay. Ben, you no, can go ahead. Go yeah, um, so I've only attended one virtual interview, um, I guess you could call it. It was a, it was a phone interview. Um, and I just want to personally say that I, I think phone interviews are not okay. <laughs> that was my personal experience with it. Um, I think, you know, Deb and Bianca might echo that. Um, phone interviews can be very convenient and very good for getting a lot out of the way um, and a lot done. Uh, but personally, phone interviews for me kind of lose a lot of that connection that you would normally form with employers, it also loses a lot of um, the, the accessibility features um, that could be very prominent in something more like Skype or a video call, which would be a great alternative. I mean, now that we're all very used to Skype as, or Zoom as the norm, I think it would be a lot more feasible to fulfill interviews via Zoom. Um, we're kind of a lot more used to how we interact and how we use these tools now. And I think that using this as an alternative to just a phone call um, would be a lot better um, from a lot of different perspectives. Some students might not identify that they have a hearing impairment of some sort. Um, some like to see facial expressions when they're talking to someone. Uh, and some might need to read lips if you're talking uh, on the Zoom meeting. So that might be something very important. And I think that's something that I was really lacking in the phone interview that I had and was a reason that, you know, I kind of stumbled and fell flat on my face. Um, I, I talk very casually when I'm in a meeting like this because I can see a lot of faces. But when I'm on the phone, not being really able to see anyone, it's not as comfortable and casual for me and I'm not able to really perform 110%. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Deborah, Bianca, anything to add? Bianca, go ahead. Yeah, so for um, the job I have now, actually, it was a virtual interview, and um, I would say it was okay. It's better than what Ben said, a phone interview, but it's still not the same as, like, in person, where, like, you can kind of see that connection. Uh, my supervisor and I were just joking how, like, because um, I'm more, like, active and, like, use a lot of gestures when I speak in person like you can't really do that too much online or else you kind of look a little like wacky right so um you kind of have to learn like how to look when you're online so that was one thing and it just kind of also feels like the like when you're talking to someone online or, or even now it feels like i'm just talking to myself so it makes me feel more awkward about myself so i guess like what helped was i had like during the interview, just like a little casual conversation at the beginning, just to kind of like get used to like the interface and just getting used to like um, how the virtual interview is gonna be like. So I think that would help to have just like a little um, casual interview and get things set up, just like make sure everyone's like plugged in in case you're like, um, uh, in, or like make sure your Wi-Fi is working properly and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that does help to kind of replicate the um, informal chatter that might happen at reception or if you were if you were interviewing in person. Uh, Deborah, anything to add just to that? Uh, yeah. Um, so for me, I had a phone interview and a virtual interview. Um, as for the phone interview, I agree with Ben. I think it's not it's not exactly um, the best because like when I had it, um, it, it felt kind of, it's been a while since I've had it. So when I had it, like, I couldn't really, I feel like I couldn't express myself, um, as well as I wanted to. Um, and I kind of wanted that face-to-face, -face, um, interaction. I think that that would have helped me kind of connect to the person interviewing me better. Um, and then for the virtual one, it was good, but I think, I feel like when you do virtual, when you set up virtual interviews, um, it's important to pay attention to like the platform you're using 
Um, I know with like um, Google Meets, uh, so I had to like sh present like a project I did and I had to share screens. And the thing is like with Google Meets, so when you um, go over to the screen you're sharing, you can't see the faces of the people you're speaking to. So it was kind of like, um, it was difficult because I was like, I don't know where to look like or what to do. Um, so I think like, I know Zoom is really good with that and that helps. So uh, I think that would have been one great, um, it would have been nice if they had like did it through Zoom instead. Um, so I guess, yeah, like, especially with time, with roles where you have to present a project that you're doing or you have to share your screen, I think like paying attention to the platform you're using is going to be like, really will really help the interviewee um, who's yeah the person who's being interviewed absolutely and it sounds like it's a it's a good opportunity for us all to really rethink what our hiring practices are and, and how we can adapt them just like um, our colleagues on the academic side are having to completely rethink how they teach and how they deliver um, classes and, and how students are uh, doing assessments um, I think I would extend that to really relooking at what our hiring practices are and, and how we can make them inclusive and accessible uh, in this virtual setting. I have another question for you, for the three of you as well. For organizations that have locations across Canada or aren't based in the GTA, would, would the three of you, or you can speak on behalf of all students if you'd like, would you be open to moving elsewhere in Canada for the right position or is staying in the GTA more important? So whoever would like to go first. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so I think that moving would actually be incredible and a great change. Um, and I personally would be very, very open to moving. Um, it's very difficult to speak on behalf of the entire student population for this specific question. Um, but I think that, you know, for the correct position or something that looked like it would be a very correct position for me, um, I would be incredibly open to it. And I think that a lot of students would be the same. Um, I think what's more important to focus on, though, is what supports would you provide as an employer to get a student to move? Um, you can't just say, hey, we have an open position across the country. Um, come move over here and we'll give you a job. Um, it's not going to be as easy as that for, for us, of course. Um, it might take a little bit more coercion, um, specifically if we don't, you know, have family in the area that we'll be moving to or friends in the area we'll be moving to. Um, are you going to help us with relocation package or stimulus? Is there going to be some sort of, you know, welcome parade when we arrive in the town? I don't know. Um, it's really important to kind of focus on what, what would you do to help the student get to that new place? Because you have to understand kind of uprooting their entire life, moving across the country would be a very difficult decision. Some might have an easier time with it than others. Um, but I think across the board, you should be providing a very supportive network and a supportive landing space for students who are making that very difficult decision. Thanks. Bianca or Deborah, what about you? Go ahead, Deborah. Um, I think for me, I would be open to, um, I feel like, it would also come down to, I guess, um, if it's a rule that like, um, and if I'm really passionate about that organization, um, or if it's a rule that uh, I'm also really interested in, um, those are some things that come into factor. Um, and also, yeah, what Ben mentioned, like is support provided for me? Um, I like, especially like moving to a new place, because um, I, I did a study abroad program and um, I went to England for like a semester, but then I, I had to come back. Um, but yeah, for the time that I was there, uh, it was, there's a lot that comes into factor when you move to a new place, a lot of things to consider. And I know like you're not entirely moving to another country, you're still gonna be in Canada, um, but there's still a lot of things that come to factor. So like what kinds of support will there be like for me um, to help me kind of like transition well um, and just like make sure like I'm doing well um, in my role. Yeah, go ahead, Bianca. Yeah, so kind of what um, Ben and Deb already touched upon is like the type of resources. Um, I'm really family and like family oriented, but if I know my family is not going to be there, like who's going, like what are my social supports? Uh, is the company going to provide like any like programs where I can like, um, or community center resources where I can go and like, you know, uh, socialize, meet people. And I think also like maybe a program that orients um, oneself into like the 
city's like culture or town because like not everything's gonna be like Toronto or like there's a certain like you know there's like a certain like vibe or like culture that um that we're used to compared to like if you go to like a different town like I think in um oh yeah in high school I went to the Northwest Territories for like an exchange um school thing for like a week and it, like the culture there is very different so um I think there you should like have like I think employers should have like a like an orientation about like the culture as well I think Absolutely. Thank you, all three of you, for that. Um, I think what I'm hearing is the importance of understanding the context of, of students or recent graduates, right? So um, understanding the context that you might be graduating uh, into a, a lot of uncertainty. So any support that can be provided um, is going to be welcome and uh, understanding what that support looks like for, for individuals as well and how it might vary. Um, that we're almost at time, uh, so I will end it there with questions. Thank you so much to all three of our panelists, Ben, Bianca, and Deborah. You guys were wonderful. I, I love hearing from students, and I'm sure uh, that everyone on the call did as well. Thank you so much for your contributions. You're going to do some amazing things, all three of you. Uh, I have no doubt about it. You're already doing amazing things. Um, and remember that we're always here to support you at the Career and Co-op Center. With that, I will hand it back to Jean-Pierre to wrap us up. Uh, thanks, Sam. Yeah, just echoing what you just said. I mean, this student team, if it isn't already obvious, they are phenomenal and we're so proud of everything they've accomplished so far and are really, really excited for what they will accomplish as they come, as they leave Ryerson and move into their careers. So thank you so much for sharing your time and insights. Um, I want to thank as well everyone that attended this call today. We're really, really appreciative that you took the time to learn more about how to connect with students and, and are willing to, to do some learning around that. Um, we want to just wrap up with a few points. Firstly, after this call, we'll be sending out a, a summary of key points within the next day or two. And with that, we'll also send a link to this recording so you'll have access to it after today. Um, we will encourage you to also fill out the survey that we send along with that and let us know how we did, but also what else you'd like to know about. So are there things that we didn't get to answer today that you'd like to see us talk about in the future? Uh, please do share that. The next thing is connect with us. So if you want to connect with us about EDI programming or about campus engagement or posting jobs, um, please do reach out. We're ready for it and we want to support you in the best way that we can. So um, let us know how and when we can do that for you. Um, the other thing is, this is very much an introductory conversation. We're only just scratching the surface of some of these conversations. Uh, and so, you know, get in touch with us and we're happy to carry this conversation further with you um, and in deeper context as it pertains to your organization specifically. So let us know how we can do that for you. 